with Fernando Ortega, not only a friend, but an accomplished musician and singer, and it's a delight. Every time I get to hear him, doesn't matter if it's here at Calvary of Albuquerque or in other places, it's like, Fernando, my heart comes alive. I don't know if it's, you have a, something in your voice, but I think it's, it's partly the passion of heart uh, that you bring to the table. And um, so we're delighted to have you. Thanks a lot. Thanks. I, I just have a couple questions for you about the book of Revelation. You can't go through the book of Revelation without coming to music as an overarching theme, especially in chapters 4 and 5. There's anthems of praise and worship going on in heaven. And then throughout the book, you know, the angelic hosts are, are rendering God worship. Um, what can the book of Revelation teach us, if anything, any cues to music or worship for the contemporary church? Well, my, my immediate thought about that is that it's... Um, since Revelation, you're in in a uh, in eternity, and so that worship, singing, um, and praise and songs of adoration are part of the God has included them in the eternal scheme of things, the eternal way of expressing um, uh, His glory and expressing His praise. In a sense, when you when you are are worshiping here on earth, you know, when you're when you're with a congregation and you join in, you're in a way, in a, in a mysterious and mystic sort of way, you're, you're entering into something that is, that is eternal. You know, you're joining with the communion of the saints and the fellowship of the saints. So it's an it's activity a, that's going to last forever, and we have a little foretaste of that now. A foretaste of it here, I think, yeah. Have you ever thought about what that kind of worship is going to be like in heaven? Have you ever tried to figure out, okay, so we're in, a, we're in bodies now, but when we're in a resurrected realm, an eternal realm with eternal capabilities. What do you think our worship? you think it'll be any different? I think, I think it'll be way different, but then, and then, and then in some ways the same. I know that the, um, the physical feeling of singing for me, I, I love that feeling. If the voice is on and, and everything's working and I'm not nervous and, or self-conscious, I love the physical feeling of, of my voice. Mm -hmm. I imagine that will be something that everybody gets to experience in heaven. As you you know, as you participate in a heavenly song, and and I imagine it's not just a, a single song going on at once, but you know, many many things joining together. You know, different mm -hmm. extol, different songs that are extolling God that, that must just meld together. You know, in this incredible way. So, what do you think about the person who on earth doesn't have a very good voice? What do you think their voice will be like there? Hang in there. You know, <laughs> <laughs> all of us need to hang in there for that person because, you know, sometimes you have to stand next to them in church. You know, there's, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, um, I, uh, I really don't know if that will be everybody's gift. I, I kind of, I, I, when you ask if I imagine it, though, that's what I do imagine, that, that there will be a, a gift of singing up there for, mm. for everybody. Mm. Okay, so here's a question I want to ask you. When you write songs, and probably every musician writes them differently, but a lot of your songs, most of your songs, maybe all of your songs, uh, have themes, biblical themes in them. So you derive inspiration from maybe one portion of Scripture or the other. I'd just be interested to know what those portions are, number one. Number two, is there anything in Revelation that inspires you toward worship or flavors songs of worship that you would write? Well, yeah, and I've, I've turned to Revelation many times to... to um to look for the, the way to express something, especially when I was trying to talk about our life as w when we are with our Creator, you know, when, we are, when the veil is gone and we, are, and we get to see Him face to face. I've used Revelation to, to talk about that. I had one song called Beyond the Sky, Beyond All Telling, mm -hmm. Our Father Himself Will Be Our Light. Um, um, a lot of times, though, I, I do turn to... Um, Psalms. One one record. I, I think I was in the cap, in the chapter in the fourteenth uh, chapter of Job for a lot of it. It was kind of a depressing <laughs> record, um, but uh, <laughs> uh, it worked really well. Though I was just looking looking to see in there the sense of um, the sort of the Hebrew sense of the finality of death in the way that when when you die, you are dead and you're waiting for the resurrection. Do you know that passage? Uh, uh, it talks about there's a, when you cut down a tree, let's see, it says, but man dies and is no more. Uh, but if you cut down a tree, at least for a tree, there's hope because at the first 
sign of water, it springs forth, you know, yes. branches. I'm totally paraphrasing. Uh, you, you got it. It's you got pretty good. I was almost a Eugene Peterson version. That was, but the Fernando yeah. Ortega the version. Fern, yeah, even better. No, yeah. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, but, um, uh, but I, I remember a, a record that was like that, that, that trying to capture that, that Hebrew sense of that, you know, waiting, waiting for, for the Messiah to come and, and the, you know, people yes. to be raised, you know. So, Fernando, of all of the passages in Revelation, is there one that sticks out to you or that would be a, considered a favorite? Well, there's one that I think about a lot, and that's the passage. That it's, it's Revelation 4.8. I know that because I looked it up before I came. But uh, the passage that talks about the four living creatures that have eyes in front of them and behind them, and that um, they're... They cease not. They cease day not. And night, day and night to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Now, why is that an important passage? Why does that ring Because I, I've sung songs before where, like uh, one song in particular is, is a St. Francis of Assisi hymn uh, called All Creatures of Our God and King, which the refrain over is over and over again, Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. And somebody said it sounded like vain repetition to them. So I, um, you know, they, they didn't like the hymn because of that. And I thought, you know, there is a such thing, of course, as vain repetition. And I think that's more of a condition of, of the heart. The heart, motive. Than exactly. it is. To, to pair, and if, and, but if it is, you know, those poor creatures are, you know, stuck doing vain repetition. And, uh, you know, for <laughs> Consigned each, forever. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I, and, and seriously, I, I, I just think of that, that they're created to do that through all of, the, of eternity. The importance of, of, of saying those things, of calling God holy. Um, and up there, of course, there will be no, no uh, vanity or, or, or we, we won't have the ability to have vain repetition up there, you know, and when we're in his presence, of course. So, Do you ever get the sense when you're at a piano and you're either worshiping privately or writing a song or leading word, do you ever get a sense that I'm joining in with the angelic choir in some sense, I'm connecting with the angelic choir right now that are rendering praise to God? I, I have very rarely, and, and I remember I, I really got that sense after a friend of mine who was a very godly person, a woman who passed away, and her husband would, would talk over and over about the communion of the saints. And there were many times uh, for the, well, the, she died four years ago now, so, and I, so I'd say four years ago was the first time I thought about that really in the middle when I was worshiping or with a congregation someplace, mm -hmm. and that I was joining in with, with, um, you know, the heavenly host or the, or the communion of the saints. And in, you know, I could feel that. And it was the, the tangible way we get, uh, feel an expression like that is, is goosebumps or, you know, shivering or something like that. But, and also a deep sense of, of just humility. Mm. But yeah, I have, but not, not very often. I want to ask you this question. When you're, when you're leading a congregation in worship, this is something that I've just noticed, that rather than trying to be like um, a spiritual... Um, uh, you know, uh, like you're trying to create incentive or be a cheerleader, like, come on, let's do this, let's do that, that you just yourself enter into the throne room and start worshiping. And it's almost by example rather than trying to convince people to do it. But it, it becomes so worshipful, it's like, where'd Fernando go? Oh, oh, he's in the throne room. Well, let's go with him. Let's go follow him. Mm -hmm. Is that intentional? Well, I'd say that uh, I used to be super um, self-conscious about it. So I, it might be intentional in that I've, I've struggled with it my whole, you know, however long I've been doing this, almost 30 years now, I guess, or is that possible? Yeah. Um, in that, uh, you know, I think in our culture, the, the, the scripture, there isn't a scriptural precedent for a guy getting up there, uh, I, I don't think, you can correct me, but getting up there and, and leading worship like that. Is there, like where you've got well, a, a... A worship leader should be a lead worshiper. A lead worshiper, yeah. I mean, there is that, right? There is that a, a precedent for that. But right. everything gets so muddled up in our culture, I think, with um, like the worship leading industry in the sense that you've, you're leading up there leading worship, but you've got your CDs out there in the foyer for sale. And, you know, there's a commercial aspect that creeps in. People come from a long way to see you do this. Um, and so, you know, it, it all adds up or points to it all feeds a kind of self-consciousness and a kind of vanity that, that might develop. So, mm. yeah, I have, I have struggled with that and, and um, you know, struggled with it in prayer and then just struggled in the actual uh, conscious struggle of, 
of trying to remove myself from, from that, getting in the way. Okay, so you hit on something that I want to go back to. You see, you've been doing this for a long time. I don't know, would you say how many years? 30 years? Uh, 30 years, that was since I was yeah. 23 and I'm 53 now. Okay, so we're seeing a, a, a resurgence or um, almost a revival of worship music, it seems like. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm excited about that. But as someone who's been doing this a long time in lots of settings, are there any warning signs or signs that, we, that, that trouble you in any of that? Well, I think one thing that troubles me is that uh, when I see it, I, I mean, when I'm, when I'm involved in those things, I go to a lot of worship things, when the band gets up there and then, you know, it starts with the, everything's blacked out in the audience, uh, and then there's the spotlight on the guy. And then as the song builds, you know, whoosh, it'll, it'll, the stage explodes. And it sort of forces the attention visually there to, to the spectacle. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess my caution, and, and, but then you see people, you hear incredible things up there like that. I still love, love those. And you, Carrie Job, I think is her name, or Joby. Mm -hmm. She sings that Revelation song. Yes. And, and, you know, she looks like she's genuinely caught up in leading worship and she has this incredible voice and that she herself is, is her, her thoughts are deflected uh, other places besides what she's doing but I think that's the caution to me is just not to let it let the spectacle become the idol mm. um, and, and not to f work so hard to, to visually draw the attention there because it, it, it is the heart has to be someplace else there. Okay, so if you were going to advise I'm putting you on the spot a little bit if you're going to advise church leaders, worship leaders, sound, lighting people, of what to do differently during a setting like that, what, what would you suggest? Well, I think to be just an awareness of it would be one. Um, and then to find out what is, uh, like in a band, good players that play together learn to play deferentially to each other. Yes. They find out what the business at hand is. And so they, the bass player listens for, to see if he's traipsing over somebody saying something important. And they all work together that way. You know, those are the best players. That When you get those kind of players, they're not all up there just to show off what they can do. I think it's got to be the same with lighting and sound, particularly lighting, in that you're not trying to mask or, um, or throw a smoke screen up to, to cover, you know, the business at hand, which is worshiping God, or, or draw attention to that, ooh, look at that effect, you know, or, yes. or you know, you know what I mean? Right. Does that answer the question? Yes, it does. Yeah. That's you, a tough one, though.